Hi, this evening I'm going to talk to you about Max Weber, just very briefly to give you an overview of his main ideas. And you'll see on Blackboard you have readings and you also have a tab called lectures. And under those tabs you'll find under readings you'll see that I, I've selected an article which gives some original writings from Max Weber on some of his key concepts and then under the lectures tab I have a, a um, PowerPoint that I made which highlights some of the key points that explain his theory of bureaucracy and of leadership and so in the video I'll try to give you an overview in a real more a really accessible way because I think a lot a lot of people might find just like with a Parsons article that it's a very intellectual approach. It's a very, um, it's a model. It gives you a way of understanding organizations or understanding leadership, understanding some broader changes in society that took place. And for many people, it might be a little bit abstract, theoretical. But again, as I said with the Parsons article, when you apply it to actual situations that you encounter, you know, for example, we are in a bureaucracy at Brooklyn College. A bureaucracy runs according to certain principles, to certain kinds of established ways of doing things. And, you know, you can think of examples of, of, of how that type of authority works. So, for example, if you're not satisfied with classes that you're taking, there's a certain, if you're having a problem in a class, or let's say you can't get into a class, you know, there are different offices that deal with all of these different issues that you might be facing. And so there are people, registrar's office, for example, who are empowered, who are given the um, authority to make certain kinds of decisions and to look at certain types of situations. And so whether you agree or not with a particular situation that you find yourself in, you realize that that person in that office holds that authority to make that kind of decision and they have the ultimate say in that in that um, problem that for re, in regards to that problem that you might be facing so that's something that we can all understand we can relate to and when Max Weber talks about bureaucracy he's really talking about a larger social shift so you had societies in the past traditional societies and for most of existence and for most people's lives they lived in traditional societies where things were prescribed. You were born into a certain kind of situation, a certain kind of family. Let's say you might be born into a caste system, a system where people from different families had different types of, were in a particular hierarchy, were in a situation where they had certain rights and privileges and other people from different kinds of families, from other castes. Uh, didn't have those same opportunities. And so the ideas that we have today about, you know, we can choose, we can educate ourselves, move forward, you know, these things really didn't exist in pre-industrial society because there wasn't a, an economy to sustain that kind of movement and that kind of flexibility. So once you have an industrial system and you have major cities like New York and Chicago and you have London and places that are thriving economically, people could come from all parts of the world, from all sectors of life, from all social classes, and there was possibility. There were possibilities for movement. Um, if you came from the, the lowest sector of the working class, you know, maybe you were going to work in a factory, in a sweatshop, in a situation that would have been not very um, not very pleasant, but still in all there was that possibility to leave the farm, to not be in an agricultural situation that your father and your grandfather and great-grandfather before you had no choice but to continue. So in a traditional society, and if we think about leadership in terms, or organizations in terms of tradition, in that kind of a structure, in that kind of a social system, you have authority, you have uh, values, you have um, a whole system of living that's passed down from one generation to another and is largely unquestioned. It's not tradition is opposed to change and innovation. Those things, those are, the, that would be the enemy of tradition, right? If you're in a traditional society, 
things are passed down in a way that is to be preserved, to be revered. You have sacred texts, you have people who pass down these ways of living, these kinds of uh, patterns of life. Everything is ascribed, is determined, and people are supposed to fall into line and follow those prescriptions. And so there's not the idea of individual choice. You, one is part of a greater uh, society or larger collectivity, and individual ideas are not really important and would be very frowned upon. And so there's many examples of uh, conflicts that could arise in that kind of, in that kind of society. Of course, if you're a very independent thinker or you're revolutionary, so tradition is is opposed. You know, you want to preserve maintain and protect and uphold the status quo. So that's that's tradition. And when you have a bureaucratic society or a society that's based on rationality, and oftentimes we, when we hear that word bureaucracy, we think, oh, it's something inefficient or something very slow moving. But in from Max Weber's point of view, and at the time that he was looking at bureaucracy, he was contrasting it with traditional societies where there was no flexibility and, and very little movement. And so for, for, for society, if we think about capitalism, if we think about economic systems of, of uh, where, where great wealth is created for individuals, bureaucracy was necessary. If you were running a huge factory, you had to run that factory or that enterprise according to very set principles. You had to have people occupy positions that were reserved for people who had certain kinds of credentials and abilities and who had certain level of experience. So when we look, you know, even currently today at a bureaucracy like Brooklyn College or at a hospital, you know, certain people can perform the surgeries that, and other people are assisting and other people are doing clerical work and each person falls into a particular position based on credentials, based on expertise, not based on the kind of family which they're born into or whether they're part of a high caste or mid middle level caste or whether they're an aristocrat or a serf. All of those, those issues in traditional societies do not apply to bureaucratic societies. In a bureaucratic society, the rationale or the logic is that you want to move forward, you want to progress, you want to make create value, you want to create profit. If you can find a, a way to do it that's more efficient, that requires less personnel, that requires um, less resources, that's what you move towards. So research, development, all of these ideas that would be contrary to tradition, you'll find in a bureaucratic society or a bureaucratic organization or a bureaucratic leader will want to institute those kinds of practices based on progress and moving forward in a direction that is profitable and that's efficient. So as we saw in the film Human Resources, one of the major important factors about bureaucracy that could be good or could be bad is that the personal factor gets factor, the personal, um, uh, or the, let's say the personal qualities of an individual get factored out. So it can be positive because, for example, think about the issue of discrimination. In traditional societies, again, the caste system is a very good example. If you're born in a lower caste, you are somebody who has no rights, no privileges, who's, who's looked upon in a way that's uh, somebody who is, who's, who's impure, who's to be avoided, who's despicable, in a sense, because you are not part of the a higher level establishment and so you're somebody who can do the dirty work, who can do things that nobody else would want to do. Um, so this is a feature of that kind of system and in a traditional, even in a, in, in a modern society, in a traditional kind of let's say organization, what could happen is that people could be discriminated against. You might believe that in a traditional family, for example, the sons the eldest son is the one who would inherit the resources or let's say if you have a family business in a traditional family the oldest son is the the older son is the one who has more authority who has more rights and who has greater responsibility and so the younger son may may be completely subservient or under the uh, jurisdiction of the older son who makes the decisions who's in charge who's charged with 
um, that kind of level of responsibility that the younger son doesn't have or that the daughter doesn't have in a family. But in a bureaucracy, um, what happens is people who are qualified, most qualified, it doesn't matter who, where you're born, who your family is, it doesn't matter what race or ethnicity you are, and that's very important because in a traditional society there, there, there is a lot of discrimination. And so if, let's say, even in, uh, let's say, a, a business, let's say there's a, a restaurant or a grocery store, the person who owns that store may have a particular um, affinity toward people of his or her own ethnic group, or they may believe that women are not really able to do certain kinds of functions as efficiently as men, and so they'll only hire men for these positions and they'll discriminate against women. In a bureaucracy, that kind of personal favoritism is factored out, which could be a very positive thing. And certainly, for example, in the U.S., when you had, um, after slavery, African Americans benefited very much by organizations that were bureaucratic, and after the Civil Rights Movement in even greater ways, because now all of a sudden it was based on qualifications, on skills, on ability, on dedication, and not on race. So when you had, um, after slavery and until, let's say, the civil rights movement, when you had, when it was possible to decide not to hire somebody or to at least to get away with it, depending on what time in history we look at, in the bureaucratic organization, it's just not a factor because you're taking an examination. So you can be black, you can be white, you can be any ethnicity, race, but the fact is you're going to be judged on the score that you achieve. And so if you're an intelligent person, if you're motivated, and if you would have been discriminated before, there's an opportunity to avoid that in bureaucracy. So that's one of the positive things, that it factors out that kind of favoritism, it factors out the fact that somebody could be promoted just because they're in the family that has connections. So of course it doesn't always work, but that's the, the that's one of the principles of bureaucracy, that your position is based on qualification and credentials. And so we see that. So another thing we can look at in terms of leadership and organizations and how they're structured and how they're functioning is the issue of charisma and also uh, contrast that with bureaucracy, contrast that with um, tradition. And so, again, bureaucracy and tradition are on opposite ends of the spectrum, and so too are tradition and charisma. So a charismatic leader, a traditional leader, first, is somebody who upholds the beliefs, who upholds a certain way of doing things, a system that's been pre-established, that's been ordained by a higher power or authority, by God, by ancestors, by some uh, force that is not to be challenged and not to be um, disrespected in any way. Whereas a charismatic leader comes from a totally different vantage point. And a good example of a charismatic leader, if we look at the religious context, if we look at Judaism, for example, you have a traditional religion that's been established, that's been functioning, and, and, and that should be protected according to the people that are in that traditional religion, right? They're sacred. Uh, prescriptions, ideas, texts, uh, there are certain kinds of regulations and rules that are to be followed and to be respected. And then you have a member of, uh, of, the, of the religion who decides to turn things over and to challenge and to institute a totally new system or new way of thinking, a new logic, a new rationality. And Jesus Christ comes along, right? And now upsets this order that should be preserved and maintained by providing another, an alternative viewpoint. And so this is an example of a charismatic leader who breaks with. So from the traditional standpoint, it's, it's something that would be negative. But from you know, the, the follower, the new followers, the people who leave the establishment or the people who come in from other directions and follow, this charismatic leader, for them, it's it's a new kind of definition of, of, of the sacred, or this is a heroic person, a person who is worthy of their attention, of their total devotion. And so a new religion is formed, a new way of life is formed in opposition, in, in a sense, in opposition to the tradition. 
And so that's a good example. And then from the Christian context, we could look, for example, the Catholic religion will trace its heritage back to Jesus. And it's important to understand with a charismatic leader like that, it's the most unstable kind of leadership because the charismatic leader depends upon its it the, the following of the charismatic leader is dependent upon his or her emotional connection and his ability to persuade or her ability to persuade people to follow and to go in his or her direction and to do things in a new way and so people are very fickle are very um you know change emotionally they're not necessarily uh, committed to the same thing for life and they can change and so if that leader is no longer there is no longer inspiring them and creating in them a sense of purpose and, and identification then whether it's in a corporation you can have a charismatic leader in a corporation it can be in a law firm it can be a fashion company it can be in a, in a media company where that person is inspirational and that person uh, it, obviously different objectives than in religion, but maybe in a, in a corporation, your, your supervisor who's charismatic can inspire you to greater levels of sales or to innovation in terms of engineering or production because that person is so inspiring and you are so tied to his or her way of thinking and you're so devoted to that kind of cause that he or she establishes as, as important and crucial that you'll put in extra hours you'll give of yourself to attain the goals of that leader and you want to be a part of his or her team or corporation whatever it might be and so what happens in this kind of charisma it's very unstable and when the leader leaves then sometimes and you you may have examples of that yourself in companies when that boss goes on to another job and somebody else takes his or her place there's no longer that level of enthusiasm so what happens in, in this Catholic religion then, it has to, in order for it to be continuing after Jesus is no longer in the picture in, in the, on the earth, what happens is the organization has to move toward bureaucracy. And that's exactly what happens. You can see the Catholic Church and you can see that you have a pope, you have a, almost like a corporate structure, very similar in that you have a CEO, you have people, everybody answers to a person above him or her. Everyone has a role, responsibilities, duties, a certain level of hierarchy, education. You know, there's a kind of, in a, in a bureaucracy, you have rational system of bookkeeping, of dealing with documents, of, of filing. So that all of those things that you find in the corporate environment, which has to be bureaucratic to be efficient and to run properly, you'll find in the Catholic Church. And, and how does it happen when its leader is no longer there that this is reproduced because you have that bureaucratic structure which keeps everybody in place and keeps a certain kind of order. And so that's important to understand. With charismatic leadership, you have it's very volatile. It's very unstable. Traditional leadership, extremely stable because it's based on, again, reproducing a certain kind of pattern over and over again. And so you have those two kinds of leaders that are very, very, very different. And you have different kinds of problems that can emerge with a bureaucratic and with a charismatic type of uh, leadership, obviously. And in the film that we saw, for example... Um, we saw human resources and in the film we saw what happens in a bureaucratic situation and Max Weber even though he highlighted the efficiency and the progress that bureaucracy can bring about in a society because it's again geared toward innovation change development all of those things that we see happen in a in a capitalist system where there's a profit motive and there's a motive to move forward to be more efficient to make more to make more money to create more value all of those things that move forward where tradition in a sense from a capitalist point of view is stagnant and is something that is old and is not and is unchangeable and is 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 fixed and rigid what the the negative part of that that other the the capitalist system or the system the bureaucratic system is that individuals lose their importance or lose their position so in a traditional society you become older you you acquire more knowledge you you deserve respect you deserve a certain kind of appreciation in a corporate system in a bureaucratic system 
what happens when you get older and when somebody else can do your job for half the price or when you don't know the new technology as well as the younger person, you become irrelevant. And in a bureaucracy, everybody is replaceable, expendable. And we saw that with Frank's father. So Frank's father was producing 700 times per minute. He was producing a certain kind of uh, item that was probably in some part of a larger system that was used in, in, in a kind again, we, we hardly know what he's producing because that was part of the, of the film, with the genius of the film, to, to show that he was detached from his work. That he, when he was at home and he was doing the craft work, he was connected and he was an expert. But when he was in the factory, he was merely uh, a worker who could be easily replaced by a machine and more efficiently replaced by a machine. And so Max Weber does talk about that, the iron cage of bureaucracy, the idea that people are trapped in this system. There's, it's a heartless system. It's not a system that cares. But again, on the positive side, it's also a system that maybe doesn't discriminate and that gives people, based on ability, chance to rise up. So it can be very positive for some people, but it also can have a very negative approach. Because in the traditional system, no matter how repressive it might be, for example, there, let's say you're working in a family business and let's say the eldest son has the responsibility, has the authority that's given to him by his father by virtue of his position as being the elder son and you're from outside the family but you're working in the business, you know, if you get on the good side of the father, or if you do a good job, if you're loyal, you know, you're never going to be like a family member, you're never going to be treated that well. But you still will, might be treated with some respect and you might be valued and you might be almost, in a sense, adopted in that family system to a certain extent where you're given certain privileges. So there's there could be a certain amount of kindness even the, even in the traditional systems, the, the master toward the serf. There's a kind of paternal, uh, you know, paternalistic respect or care for this serf who's working under the master. And so that exists in a traditional society, but you don't see that in a bureau in the cold, in the very calculated, rational, legal bureaucracy. And so that's a drawback, and that's something that Max Weber calls our attention to. So so when you do the reading, try to think about organizations that you work in. What kind of leadership do you have? Do you have first of all, is it a bureaucracy or is it a traditional? organization. If, let's say, you're working in a traditional family business, you might not have records, you might not have, people might not be hired based on qualifications, based on education. They would be hired because they're from the same ethnic group or because they're from the same family. So it might be based on very, very different kinds of criteria. Um, you know, promotion might be based on loyalty or personality. In the bureaucracy, you're promoted because you have done an efficient job and you're, you've pre created a measurable, you, you, you've created a deliverable that can be measured, that, can, that, that you can apply some kind of analytic system to and say that this is the kind of um, contribution that the person has made. It can be justified, it can be quantified. In traditional systems, it's about feeling, it's about emotion, it's about um, values and reproducing a certain kind of pattern that is a st has been established. And it's about power and about that uh, authority that takes on a very different form. So the charismatic leader has authority. People trust in that leader because they give him or her a, a sense of importance and they believe that that person is justified to make decisions and to, and to guide them in a certain direction. In a bureaucracy, we believe that the person who is our supervisor ideally has uh, the experience greater than ours or has education that's at a higher level than ours and that can then make decisions that we might not have access to. Uh, could you know use a certain kind of, uh, is using knowledge that we don't have access to or that we don't know how to use in the same way. And in the um, charismatic system, Again, the person is, is sacred, they're heroic, they have some kind of special powers or abilities or connections that somehow give them the right or give them, require us to show deference to them. So each system requires a different type of devotion. 
each a different type of obedience in an authoritarian or bureaucratic system. You have different kinds of obedience, you know, based on different criteria. And so think about how that relates to systems that you're working in, that you're functioning in, Brooklyn College, how classes are run, how, how departments are structured. Try to be aware of that. And then when you're in organizations, you're not just merely... Um, you know, acting or reacting, but you're analyzing and you're formulating opinions and you're able to create um, new systems that may be more effective. And so very important to be thinking if you want to have a responsible position, you have to be thinking constantly about how can you change things? How can you improve whatever situation you're in? It could be a club, it could be um, an organization that you're volunteering in. It could be a company that you eventually work for. But you want to think about getting to the next level, about doing, figuring out what has to be done, what kind of knowledge people that are in positions that you would like to be in have access to and how to gain access to that knowledge and to those kinds of experiences to move up in the organization. So it has a very practical... You know, if you don't have, if you don't see a structure, a pattern, if you don't see any discernible system, then it's very difficult to move up and to move across and to be able to make decisions. When you understand the structure, when you understand the culture, when you understand the kind of pattern and model that's in place, you are, in a sense, more powerful, and you have an ability to critique, to analyze, to evaluate that you don't have if you just are reacting and um, you know not actively participating in the analysis and in the participation of the organization. So think about how you can apply these things because otherwise they don't really have a value as just theoretical concepts. They need to be applied to actual situations to take on a life of their own. So thank you for listening and looking forward to next lecture.